Hi, my name is Khaled Abumari. I'm a PhD candidate in electrical and computer engineering at Johns Hopkins. And together with my advisor, Ralph Etienne Cummings, we're excited to show our work on learning spatial temporal filters to track visual saliency. Very briefly, the agenda that we have is comprehensive. We're going to talk about visual saliency a little bit, um, talk about the data set that we were given, handcrafting filters, which is a typical approach, um, pre-processing for visual, for specifically our visual saliency model. Then the, you know, the most important part, which is the spatial temporal filters and the application of such filters. Now, in order to appreciate the algorithms we'll be proposing, it is important to understand visual saliency and its potential in computer vision. Now, specifically uncovering the nuances behind visual saliency or the tendency to gaze in a particular direction or toward a particular object is critical in understanding what and why the human mind focuses on specific features in that field of vision. So there's a wide variety of these applications, um, applications in which visual sanity would provide significant steps forward, such as robotic um, agents, teletourism, high accuracy drone cameras, live data analysis for traffic, and criminal investigations. However, little improvements have actually been made in exploiting the efficient characteristics of event-based cameras in trying to comprehend how and why humans tend to gaze at these non-obvious features. Sure, saliency algorithms crafted around frame-based cameras like moving object detection and stereoscopic vision algorithms have pulled the curtain back somewhat around how objects passing through our field of vision can grab our attention. Um, but the true unadulterated spike-based approach has yet to be fully exploited simply because frame-based cameras do not produce spike-based information. But luckily, with event-based cameras at our disposal, we could begin this investigation. In order to test uh, any model, we needed a good comprehensive data set, and we were given just that from Prophecy. Uh, the top set of data is labeled as the streetcar data set. Um, it's, it was captured by mounting an ATIS camera on top of a car and driving through an urban environment. It caught a lot of different type of information here, a lot of different features. It caught people moving at different rates. There's different temporal planes, different spatial planes. There's depth, there's buildings, there's uh, advertising billboards. It's quite a plethora of uh, interesting features that exist in that data set. Now, the bottom data set is labeled as motorway. Same way the information was captured, it was an ATIS camera mounted on top of a car driving uh, on a freeway. And this data set we liked a lot because it was way more homogenous, right? There's cars moving in one specific area of the screen until the car decides to start driving down the freeway. But until that point, the data is very, very homogenous. So we figured testing these two data sets or testing our algorithm on these two data sets would help us span the spectrum of robustness uh, for any model to see its validity. Now, as is typical for any tracking algorithm before any learning is done, we need to pre-process and prune the event-based information before placing our fixation point or our tracker um, for this field of vision. So here we illustrate how event thresholds, or lack thereof, determine where learning happens in a screen. Unfortunately, with event-based information at such high resolution, there's a huge wave of information that is really difficult to manage and inundates the computing resources. So setting simple thresholds, such as statistical metrics like standard deviation and distances, these provide a sufficient baseline approach in deciding whether or not an object has the potential of being salient or not. On the left-hand side of the screen, you have the um, initial approach, the finding a new target, have a certain number of events occurred within a specific region. And with respect to the initialization of that fixation point, here we call it the centroid. Um, you know, is this within a specific threshold? Does this, um, does this new event actually requires some fixation. On the right-hand side of the screen, we have the continuing to follow the, the, the target. So are there events that are being generated in that area still, right? And these two different branches would have two different thresholds. So there's one more sort of background slide we need to discuss, and that's the formulation of these so-called spatiotemporal filters, okay? 
So spatial temporal filters are really significant in computer vision. Why? Simply because they capture the temporal and the spatial information in a compact and entirely relevant way. A spatial temporal filter can give insight on the direction, on the speed, on the magnitude, on the frequency, on the geometry of an object, and much more. So on the top left hand side of the screen, you'll see a typical vertical filter that can be used for erected objects like humans or rectangular signs. Now this works for humans and rectangular signs, but it fails when working in a very robust environment. And so instead of exhausting and creating a bunch of handcrafted filters, there must be a more automated way to do that. And that would be to be learning these filters. Now, the other two figures you'll see on the screen are different representations of these learned filters. And as you can tell, the direction, the speed, the geometry of what was a bird moving through a screen um, are become very obvious and start to make a little more sense to people who are trying to analyze, you know, computer vision information. Now, on top of this, matching difficult to fit events, things that are and require a little more robustness in their matching becomes much, e much easier because of the high generalizability of these models. They have a much more matchable standard deviation. Now the way that these spatiotemporal filters get this shape is every time an event occurs, it's convolved with a time constant that actually gives it a little bit of lifetime. There's this exponential kernel that it's convolved with. Now this is um, supposed to be around the same scale of, of a neuron and that's kind of the idea is that this information can stay alive a little longer than just the time that it actually occurred. Now given our data set and given our information how can we build a model that uses the power of unsupervised learning to enhance saliency tracking? Now, we decided to make an ensemble-like model where the first part is inspired from HOTS, the hierarchy of event-based time surfaces, where spatiotemporal filters or activation prototypes or templates are learned through clustering. And then we took that information and used different distance metrics in the clustering and then fed it into a series of match decision trees. Um, which helped a lot with the real-time learning and something we'll discuss later on called lifelong learning. Now, regarding the distance metrics that we used um, in equation two and then for the clustering for equation three, um, instead of using the typical L2 norm Euclidean comparison, we decided we needed something much faster for online computation, stuff for on-chip resources that, can, that they can actually handle. And it seemed that in terms of finding the correlation between two time surfaces, we were shown that the comparison of their linear independence as represented by the determinants is sufficient for finding something that's close using some sort of metric. Now these computations were all compared um, in a decision tree afterwards, which measured three things. These were the, kind of the stabilizing points. Recency, how recent was this in the time frame at this spatial region in this event? Robustness, you know, what is the measured variability and generalizability and the relevance, finally, which was more of a knob-like filter that a user could use to look for specific characteristics like high frequency or specifically banded items. Now, these three trees were then concatenated at the end, and of course, for Rudo set random selection gave rise to a random forest. That's what that part of the ensemble model is. And the weights came out and decided, you know, what is the new spatial temporal filter that is now going to change based on the event that just came in. Now, these decision trees were added um, after the algorithm, after the clustering algorithm was made. And the reason for that is because we wanted to create um, a lifelong learning situation, a situation where information is not being lost over time. And in fact, information is just becoming more stable and at the same time, more plastic. Now, what is lifelong learning? So lifelong learning is the capability to sort between trivial and non-trivial information throughout a lifetime, right? It's our human capacity to continue learning relevant information. And a big part of this is stability plasticity. How easily does our learned information change based on new information. Well, using decision trees in the architecture of a random forest as we show in the previous slide 
helped ameliorate this sort of issue. You know, how do we handle all of this information over time in a way that um, is most relevant to the application that we're trying to use, right? So specifically these decision trees in the form of a random forest are really helpful because they're space efficient. It helps with continual learning and really importantly, there's no catastrophic forgetting, which is typical in learning frameworks, right? Sometimes information is just lost. And this typically happens with decision trees that um, have information on kind of the, uh, the leaves. And so um, kind of putting these decision trees in this form and then having a pseudo random selection helped ameliorate specifically that issue. Uh, there are a few learning parameters actually to ensure that this is true. And so implementing this uh, block of learning has been re relatively trivial, but also extremely, extremely vital. Now, even with lifelong learning, even with a change distance metric from L2 to determinants, we still come to a bottleneck when it comes to event-based processing management, right? We have a lot of data that is coming our way because of the 20-bit, 10 nanosecond sensor data interface that the ATIS provides. Um, so our approach, of course, is to chop up the learning and application into time blocks where one or the other is accomplished. As you can see here, we picked 10 microsecond blocks because it matched our interface. And so this online, offline learning application scheme seemed to work out for the most part. Here, we were really just looking to use a pipeline to optimize the low resource compatibility of um, a lot of chips, especially if we want this to you know, be a, an out in the field application. So here's our first batch of learning using this pipeline. On the left, we have the streetcar data set. On the right, we have the motorway data set, right? So there are some noticeable results. Um, first of all, the hyperparameters here are the number of uh, prototypes or the number of acti activation templates or the spatial temporal filters, the, um, the templates for those. That's n equals four or n equals 16. And then there's the region, the spatial region that we're actually going to be convolving with an exponential kernel, which varies from four um, to 16 as well. So there's not a lot that can be discerned, but what we can say is that there's certainly quite um, a lot of information that's captured in these filters. Um, the filter in, in the top left most space is the filter that had the most matches. It was the most general and the filter that was in the bottom right space of these matrices had the lowest number of matches. So these are the filters that had the least generality. Here's some more visualizations. Now, these aren't very practical um, filters. The reason is because the regions are huge. You know, they're 128 uh, pixel dimensions. So, you know, it's a very big filter, but the point of this is more of a proof of concept that the spatial temporal filters are learning the you know, the movement and the features and the information from this event-based, uh, from these event-based cameras. Okay, so here's an actual application of the filters we learned from the Prophecy data set. On the left, you'll have the original APS data of the motorway, and on the right, you'll have two videos. The top video is of an experienced observer, someone who has seen the temporal difference data many times, now, an inexperienced observer most likely ignores features that are most obvious, and we predict will most likely find the nuanced features to focus on. Now, the bottom video is an inexperienced observer, someone who has never seen the TD data, someone we predict will fixate on the most obvious features in the data stream. In the middle, we have the three fixation points as shown in the videos as green, red, and yellow. Now, green is the filter that had the most matches in the, um, based on the unsupervised learning algorithm. Uh, red is the filter that had the least amount of matches for the unsupervised learning algorithm. And yellow is the experienced or unexperienced observer, someone who put on an eye tracking headset and was presented the, the data. Now, based on the fixation points for each of these cases, the table in the bottom left shows the percent of the time that the markers overlapped, meaning how similar were the fixation points for the green, red, and yellow markers. 
Now, what we show here is that the experienced observer, someone we predict will focus on the less obvious features, matches more with the red filter, the filter with the lowest amount of matches. Now, this agrees with our intuition and predictions in that the experienced observer isn't looking at the most stark features. It's vice versa for the inexperienced observers. Uh, they match much more with the filter that has the highest generality and captures the most information. The inexperienced observer is most likely going to be looking at those obvious features. And of course, the highest percent of matching comes from the inexperienced observer and the experienced observer, most likely because they're both human subjects in this case. Now on this slide, we have the streetcar data set. In this situation, we have the same sort of predicted results. The inexperienced observer, someone who is focusing on the more obvious features, matches up with the green filter or the template that matches, that has the most matches and captures the most information. And then you have the experienced observer matches up with more of the red filter, the template with the least matches. Now to truly validate this template and to truly validate the information that we have and to provide a verifiable metric, we need to capture much more human-based observations in a closed environment like a headset to establish a ground truth data set. That way we can have a universal metric for visual saliency fixation on event-based information. Okay, so with all of this information in an attempt to create the most unhindered spike-based data set, we want to continue and propose using an eye-tracking headset that entirely encloses the subject's field of vision and is resilient to any head movement whatsoever. This is because, of course, while 3D saliency data is important, event-based cameras currently only capture information um, in 2D. So any head movement would actually disrupt the eye tracking accuracy. But we believe in an entirely enclosed, uninterruptible eye tracking headset, subjects will be able to observe events as they occur with limited noise or outside factors. For subjects to take part in um, this sort of data acquisition, we want to pipe event-based data into the 2D tracking um, environment for the subjects to observe. And then they'll be shown two different data sets, of course, the data sets that we've been working with. These, um, after uh, um, you know, getting quite a few subjects, we believe that we can build a data set that can then show us a ground truth fixation point so that a bunch of these saliency models can finally be um, validated and compared and, and verified. Um, so with that, uh, we'll leave it to questions and thank you very much.